about inviting me back. I, I had a great time doing that lecture three years ago. As Brandon said, I've gotten lots of responses. I get emails from it all the time from people who have seen it. So uh, that was entitled, What's Wrong with Calvinism? You might entitle today's lecture, What's Wrong with Calvinism? Part 2. Okay. <laughs> so this one is on Calvinism and the God of Love. Calvinism and God of Love. Right there, it's got that t-shirt on that says love. See, that's Calvinism and Crow right there. They just don't have the right view uh, of love. Okay, so I hope to show this shortly. Now, uh, this book that Brandon mentioned, he didn't mention the subtitle. The subtitle is The Heart of What is Wrong with Calvinism. Alright? And uh, I hope to demonstrate that today. And I want to begin, I want to begin with a hymn. From uh, my favorite, my favorite hymn writer, Charles Wesley, one of my favorite hymns by him, and this is entitled "Come, O Thou Traveler Unknown," and it's based on the story of Jacob wrestling with the angel back in Genesis. It's got 14 verses, and Charles Wesley ingeniously took this story of Jacob wrestling with the angel as a sort of story or parable or image of wrestling with God in salvation, of how God breaks the sinner down, you know, brings him to God and all this kind of thing. So the second verse of this says, I need not tell thee who I am. My sin and misery declare. Thyself has called me by my name. Look on my hands. Look on the nail prints in your hands. Look on my hands and read it there. You'll see that I'm a sinner. But who, I ask, who art thou? You know who I am. But who are you? As Jacob asked the angel. Tell me thy name. And tell me now. He goes in several more verses. And then several verses later, the answer comes. Tis love. Tis love. Thou diedst for me. I hear thy whisper in my heart. The morning breaks, the shadows flee. I notice this line. Pure, universal love. Pure, universal love thou art to me, to all. Notice that. To all, thy mercies move. And in that last line, he's asking it again, who are you, what's your name? By nature, and thy name is love. Your name is love. Your nature is love. All right? So this idea that, that God has universal love. Now, the biblical story is a great love story. So go back to this uh, passage right here. Notice this linking of verses from the Gospel of John. It sort of summarizes the great love story of Scripture. And notice the story goes way back in the eternity before the world even existed. Okay? Jesus in John 17 is praying what is called the high priestly prayer. And Jesus says, You, that is the Father, loved me before the creation of the world. Well, there's any world. God didn't need a world to be loved. He's loved from all eternity because there are three persons within the Trinity. So before there were any angels or people or worlds or anything else, God was loving because the Father loved the Son, the Son loved the Father and the Holy Spirit. You've got love. Now, notice the second verse. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Think about that. The love that existed from all eternity, Jesus says, I love you with that kind of love. Eternal Trinitarian love. That's what you see in, in, in my love for you. Now, it's really interesting when you think about this verse now in light of the first two. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. So, before the world was created, you loved me. I loved you the way the Father loved me. Now you love each other the way I have loved you. Amazing. Oh, one more. This one's intriguing in light of these previous verses. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, 
we will come to him, we will make a home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. Now look at this extraordinary verse and let's apply it. <clears throat> the Lord of the universe, the God of love, says, if you obey my teaching, if anyone loves me, you will obey. My father will love me, we will come to him, make our home with him. God wants to be at home in your life. But guess what? We may choose amazingly not to obey Him. We may choose not to love Him back, according to this verse. That's what He wants. That's what He prefers. But we may choose not to do it. Now, let's try to make this uh, a little more theologically precise, philosophically precise. I want to look at some distinctions, some definitions of different kinds of love. And here I'm going to draw on the <coughs> of a recent, uh, a recent book entitled The Love of God, A Canonical Model by a young theologian by the name of John Peckham. It's a great book. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. And this is based on an 800-page dissertation in which he did an exhaustive study of love in the Bible. And it's a remarkable book because he's got not only command of the biblical languages and biblical scholarship, but also theological and philosophical scholarship. It's a great book. Anyway, several distinctions here I want you to, to, to note. By the way, can we turn these lights out up here? Is that possible? I tried. Huh? I tried earlier. I wasn't able to get them down. You we're, we're getting them. Right, I'm sorry. Can you, start, can you still see the screen? You can see it? Okay, good. All right. So, he says, God's subjective love and objective love differentiate between the love which belongs to God's character independent of any external objects, his subjective love. And that love which corresponds to and is affected by creaturely objects, objective love. God's subjective love is prior to and the unchanging and unconditional ground of God's relationship to the world. It is the basis of his relational love which reaches out to creatures via loving actions. All right, so you've got subjective and objective love. <clears throat> subjective love is that kind of love described in John 17. Before the grace of the world, you love me. It's the love within God's very nature. He is a subject of love, okay? And notice, it is the, it is the unchanging and unconditional ground of God's relationship to the world. This is his objective love, his love toward other persons outside of himself. So you've got the subjective love, which is God's very character, the relationship of love among the persons of the Trinity, his very essence to be a, a loving being. And then you've got his objective love, which reaches out to other beings and other persons. All right? Now, that's a distinction there. Now, here is a, a further distinction. He distinguishes two different kinds of relational love. You have universal versus particular relational love, all right? So whereas God's universally relational love is the undeserved and unprompted initiating love that God bestows on each human prior to any response, God's particularly relational love refers to God's special and intimate love for those who respond to him and thus enter into reciprocal love relationships. God's particularly relational love is thus the result of two things. God's initiating, enabling love on the one hand, as well as appropriate human response. Alright, so God's, God's relational love. There's a universal dimension and there's a particular dimension. Universally, it reaches out to every single person and draws them, invites them. God's particular relational love is the love that He can give to those who positively respond to it. So does God love some people more than others? <clears throat> the answer is yes. Why? Because some people open their hearts to that love and are more willing to receive that love than other people. It's not because God prefers some above others, beforehand. His universal love goes out to all equally. 
His universal relational love. His particular relational love varies according to our response. So yes, there are some people God loves more than others. But it's because they allow Him to. They open their heart. They receive that love. They welcome it. As they welcome it and receive it, He gives them more and more. The more they receive, the more He gives. Alright? So there is a difference between universal and particular. But again, it's not because of God's character or choosing some, not others. It is because some respond and open their hearts and receive it. All right, now one more passage from John Patrick before we move on. This is an elaboration on this universal love to all people. In this way, God truly desires, and notice this, does everything He can do within the bounds of bilateral significant freedom in working towards the salvation law. Now bilateral is those two ways. God has freedom. He's also given us freedom to respond. It's a two-way freedom. Alright? So God does, He truly desires, He does everything He can within the bounds of bilateral significant freedom and working toward the salvation of all. Consequently, some are loved by God more intimately than others. But again, why is that the reason? But not because God decides to exclude anyone from such a relationship. Those who are finally lost could have been insiders, but they were not willing. All right, this is the great news of the gospel. The great news of the gospel is God invites everyone to be an insider. Go back to that John passage. The Father wants to make his home within you. And if you love him, if you obey him, he will come in and make his home with you. I am the Father. You can all be an insider. God wants everyone to be, but some simply choose not to be. But again, it isn't because God doesn't extend that universal love to all people. Now, with these definitions on the table, I can begin to get at what I want to focus on this afternoon, where Calvinism is deficient in its view of God's love. It is this universal love, God's sincere love for all persons, that Calvinism has trouble accounting for. Indeed, I would go so far as to say, Calvinism seems to have a glaring blind spot when it comes to the love of God. Let me give you a couple of exhibits. Here is one of the questions from the Westminster Shorter Catechism, a standard classic expression of Calvinist theology. Question, what is God? Answer, God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Now, do you notice something missing from that list that just sort of cries out? The most beautiful, explicit definition of God in the New Testament, in the Bible, is God is love. That doesn't make the list. Now, let me give you another little fact, boy. But again, I find very tough. My Calvinist friends find it annoying when I point this out. They say, oh, you're making sure you can do this. But I think it's tough. Don't tell you. Question. You heard John Calvin's Institutes? His 1,500-page sort of systematic theology <laughs> in which he lays out in great detail the doctrine of God and central Christian doctrines you've heard of, right? Landmark, an important work in, in, in Christian thought, to be sure. The index, the scripture index, for this book is 40 pages long. 40 pages. Listing thousands upon thousands of texts that come in sides, and it's a heavily biblical work. It's not a philosophical work. It is biblically driven through and through. How many times would you guess in the Institutes, Calvin cites the verse, God is love, in this massive work that cites thousands and thousands of texts? Anyone guess? Does anyone know? Anyone want to take a shot? Take a shot. Zero. It's zero. Not a single time 
in 1,500 pages in which he goes into great detail talking about the character and nature of God, does he cite the phrase, the verse, God is love? Now again, my time is very warmly. I've never met him, but it's one of my critics. Wrote this article after me and saying, oh, he's a hack. He's like pointing that out, you know. Why should you expect Calvin to cite God as love? Because not everybody's the other people before Calvin, they didn't cite it either, right? Well, not all these people wrote works of this size and scope and were such a biblical group of works. But at any rate, I don't want to make too much of it. So again, to our Calvin's critics who will be listening to this, I don't want to make too much of this, but it is suggestive. It's the most beautiful definition of God in the Bible didn't make a single appearance in Calvin's Institutes. All right? Now, why is that the case? Well, I think it's because of the very central doctrines of Calvinism. So let's cite a couple of passages from Calvin, uh, in which he states a couple of his most famous doctrines. Namely, here is unconditional election. And Calvin writes as follows. Indeed, many, as they wish to avert a reproach to God, Accept election in such terms as to deny that anyone is condemned, but they do this very ignorantly and childishly, since election itself could not stand a set over against reprobation. I'm going to talk more about reprobation later in the lecture. The reprobation is God's choice from all eternity to create some people that He will then damn. All eternity. I will talk about that later. Now notice this. Therefore, those whom God passes over, he condemns. And notice this phrase. And this he does for no other reason than that he wills to exclude them from the inheritance which he predestines for his own children. For no other reason. Now, Calvinists will sometimes say God has his reasons. We don't know what they are. It's none of our business. But at least during this passage, Calvin just says, no other reason because he chooses to. He's God. And he chooses to pass over and reprobate some people. And we're going to talk later about some reasons Calvin say God does this, right? But this is again telling, right? Uh, this, this idea again, no election without reprobation. It goes both ways. Some people are elected for salvation. Some people, for all eternity, God chooses to reprobate. All right? Now, here's another passage from Calvin. This is a passage on Calvin's doctrine of irresistible grace, which is the doctrine that if God chooses you for salvation, you will not be able to resist his overtures. He will cause you, determine you to freely respond as Calvin's divine freedom. If you want to hear more about that, watch my previous lecture that I did here from years ago. But anyway, I, I, this is very telling also from Calvin writes. I at least maintain this teaching of Augustine. Where God makes sheep out of wolves. And that's what God does when He saves people. He takes wolves and He makes sheep out of them. Alright? So, where God makes sheep out of wolves, He reforms them by a more powerful grace to subdue their hardness. Accordingly, God does not convert the obstinate because He does not manifest that more powerful grace which is not lacking if He should please to offer it. So any wolf he wants to make a sheep out of, he can make a sheep out of any wolf. There's some wolves he simply doesn't want to make sheep out of and leaves them as wolves and they go to hell. All right? Now, these doctrines, when you understand what Calvin is saying, it's not surprising that love falls out of the picture. Notice, Calvin is, is, is so... Interested in talking about power. And look, God's power, all powerful. I mean, make this massive universe for a start. I mean, galaxies billions of light years away. Raise Jesus from the dead. God is enormously, infinitely powerful. No question. But is that his most significant defining feature? That's the thing that seems so important here. All right? He can make sheep out of any wolf he wants. Some wolves he just doesn't want to make. Or sheep. Now, to understand this a little more clearly, 
Thus the blog of the basic logic of the matter. And let me hasten to say before I start talking about this, that uh, the full version of this argument appears in a journal article, in a journal called Philosophy of Christie, 2011, an article entitled, Why No Classical Theist, Let Alone Orthodox Christian Should Ever Be a Compatibilist. So there I spell it out in full form, it's much longer, and connect all the premises to make it logically valid. This represents only the bare bones to simplify it. All right, so if you want to see the full version of it, look at that journal article. <clears throat> All right, here's the basic logic. Premise number one, God truly really loves all persons. Now, most people believe that. And in fact, you often hear Calvin say that they believe God loves all persons. Premise number two, not all persons will be saved. Now, these first two premises right away cause a problem for any school of theology. If God loves everybody, why do people go to hell? I don't care what your theology is, that's a tough problem. I've written books about it, spent a lot of my career writing about it. Sachs wrote a great article about it, I wrote a great article about how read Zach's article. Uh, but it's a hard problem. You know, it's not easy. So I'm not saying only Calvin's have a problem here. We all got This is a tough problem. I'm trying to explain why people would choose to go to hell and end up there. <clears throat> right? But most Traditional Christians believe both of those two premises, most, not all, but most. Now, we come to the third. Truly to love someone is to desire their well-being, their true well-being, and to promote their true flourishing as much as you properly can. So if you love someone, you don't give them everything you want if you're a parent. You, you don't have kids yet, most of you are take it, but someday maybe you will. And when you have kids, if you love them, you don't give them everything they want, but you do want what's truly good for them. If you are going to be a loving father or mother, you will promote their true flourishing, what will actually be for their good. Right? So that's what true love. Now, the phrase here, properly, is important as much as you properly can. I defined this in a footnote in the little book. And you do something properly if you're going to do it without losing some greater good or some overriding good. So you love as much as you can without sacrificing some possible greater good that would, that would interfere with it. That, that's the qualification that's important to understand. Now, for premise number four, the well-being and true flourishing of all persons is to be found in a right relationship with God, a saving relationship in which we love and obey Him. So that's the true good of everybody. If you are a person made of the image of God, your true flourishing is to love God, to be rightly related to God and other persons who do. All right? So, we come down to verse number five. God could properly, and by the way, I added that word because, again, one of my Calvinist critics attacked that book and said, well, I should have put the word properly in there. He's right. Uh, to make it clear, I should have. I tried to cover that footnote, but for um, better clarity, the word should be there. All right? So, again, the claim here is God could properly give all persons irresistible grace. He could make a sheep out of any wolf he wants. He could do this, and he could thereby determine all persons to freely, as Calvinists define freedom, and again, if you don't understand this, read that book, watch the earlier video. Freely accept a right relationship with himself and be saved. God can give everybody irresistible grace, at least insofar as freedom is concerned. A sheep out of any wolf he pleases. So, so far as God's freedom is concerned, his power is concerned, he can save everybody so far as freedom is concerned. Conclusion, therefore, all persons will be saved. Now, obviously, there's a contradiction between six and two. Now the question is, how do you, you know, avoid the contradiction? Which of those premises do you deny to avoid this conclusion? Well, the answer for Arminians is very straightforward. We deny this one because we believe that grace is not resistible. If God gives us true freedom, we can freely choose to resist it and reject it. That's the one we're going to reject. But what about Calvinists? Which of those is a Calvinist going to reject? Well, it seems the only viable option they got 
is to deny either three or one in the first claims. You would deny that true love means to actually want someone's well-being, must mean something other than that, or just flat out deny that God truly loves all persons. Now, let's look at how Catholics in fact respond to this. Well, the most straightforward response is simply to deny the first premise. And to simply say, well, God doesn't love everyone. And here's a quote from one of my favorite Calvinists, Arthur W. Pink. He's a classic Calvinist. I like, I like that because it's forthright. And he says this, no nonsense, unvarnished Calvinism. When we say God is sovereign in the exercise of his love, we mean that he loves whom he chooses. God does not love everybody. So he just says it. And frankly, I think he understands Calvinism and simply embraces it without flinching and without embarrassment. Um, and I wish more Calvinists actually would do that. Now, most do not, as we're going to see, right? But that's one way to, to respond to this contradiction, is just to say, well, God doesn't love everybody. That's why everybody's going to say, yes, of course he could turn all these wolves into sheep, and he doesn't want to, he doesn't love everybody, that's no problem. God can love who he wants, he doesn't love everybody. So what? Think you, God's God. Right? That's one response. Now, most Calvinists, however, do not overtly deny that God loves everyone. Interestingly, most Calvinists also want to insist that, yes, as a matter of fact, we too believe God loves everyone. Now, the moves they have to make along this line are very interesting, okay? But that's what they typically do. I just read this book, which I'm going to be discussing actually tomorrow uh, at a conference, called Calvinism and the Problem of Evil. If you want to see what the clever Calvinists are saying right now, this is a great resource, Calvinism and uh, the Problem of Evil. At any rate, what I found fascinating as I read through this book is how many times these guys you know, came up against this problem and said, well, yes, there's a sense in which God loves everybody. We're going to look at some of those you know, before this lecture is over. But they, they don't want to go with our for double pain. They don't just come out and say, God doesn't love everybody. And they, like, they like to say, yes, of course he loves everybody, right? Well, what they have to do, however, if they don't want to God like deny God loves everybody like this, what they end up doing is defining love in a very idiosyncratic or novel sense of the word. So here, my favorite example, and I talked about this last time I was here, so this is this is something you've already heard, those of you who've seen the lectures, but it fits so well in what I'm talking about today, I got it included. D.A. Carson. He is a noted uh, Calvinist. Theologian exegete at Trinity Divinity School. And he writes this in the book on the love of God. When I've preached or lectured in Reformed circles, I have often been asked the question, do you feel free to tell unbelievers that God loves them? Of course I tell the unconverted that God loves them. Now here's a couple of things that are telling. Notice, he says, often, when I preach in Calvinistic Reformed circles, I get this question. Now what does that tell you right there? Not once in a while, not occasionally. I'm often asked, can you tell the unconverted God loves them? That tells you right there, once a Calvinist feel this tension. And wonder, given what we believe about unconditional election, should we tell the converted God loves them? Because for all we know, they're not elect. Can we tell people that? Carson says, of course! Here's interesting. Here's how he does it. He draws a distinction between three kinds of love. Right? Here's what he distinguishes. First of all, there's what he calls God's providential love over all that he has made. And this consists in the fact that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Doesn't matter whether you love God, believe in God, love Jesus, but it rains, it'll rain on your garden. Or when the weather's bad, it doesn't matter. It's bad weather, it's everybody too. So, there's food for everybody, water for everybody, air for everybody to breathe. God gives out to everybody, saved or not. So he loves you in the sense that he gives you those kinds of blessings. <clears throat> right? Now, secondly, there's what he calls God's salvific stance toward his fallen world. And that's what means this. God invites everybody to believe the gospel. 
So Calvinists can and properly do say, whosoever will may come. Anyone who wants to come can come. You're all invited. Now, if you're not elected, you can't come. You won't want to come. But still, you, if you're still invited, if you want to come, you can. Even though if you're not elected, you won't want to. You can't want to. But the Calvinists can still say, whosoever will. So God takes the up and expands even for his Right? Now, thirdly, you've got God's particular, effective, selecting love, which is only towards his elect. That only goes to the elect. Now here's the question I ask you. If God doesn't love you with number three, is there any meaningful sense in which he loves you if he loves you only in the first two senses? I think the answer is obviously no, and here's why. If you're not elect, you will not be able to give God gratitude for his blessings, his material blessings. If you're not elect, you can't possibly respond positively to the gospel. So what that means is simply this. One and two will simply be occasions for further condemnation on judgment day if you're not elect. I illustrated with this story. Suppose there were a scientist who, um, who has some experiments he wants to perform with human beings. They're going to be very painful experience, experiments that will result in their death. But for these experiments, he needs some really healthy 25-year-olds. So what he does, he adopts a bunch of babies, secures a bunch of babies, and they all come running, just correctly, correctly, get away with it. And he raises these, these babies in prime conditions. He gives them the best of food, the best of clothes, when they're 16, he gives them all nice cars to drive. Membership in a gym where they have great fitness, great doctors, cared for in every way. And he frequently tells them, I love you people. That's why I'm giving you all this stuff. I love you people. Right? When they're 25, he then subjects them to these experiments, these painful experiments, which lead to their excruciating death. Now I ask you, does he love these people? Despite the fact that he lavishly provides for them, in these physical terms and physical blessings, I think the answer is obviously no. That's like giving material blessings to someone that is chosen, that is created for reprobation and damnation. So Carson's ploy here, I think is really hard to, to take seriously. Because, I mean, suppose he just were straightforward. And he says, of course I tell the unconverted God not to. Now what I mean by that is just this. I mean, rain will fall in your garden. I mean, there's air for you to breathe. I mean, you're invited to believe the gospel. Now, for all I know, Jesus did not die for you. For all I know. For all I know, you are one of those chosen for reprobation. For all I know. But hey, he gave us water for your garden. If it was straightforward, would anybody take it seriously? That's the point. So he has to resort to radical equivocation in order to say, of course I tell the unconverted God loves them. I think that's a serious problem. Now, here's another move that Calvinists make, and this is one I want to focus on a little more. Calvinists also like to say, look, here is, here's what we've got to come to terms with an understanding. God has certain goals that are simply incompatible with his saving all people. And one of the classic, one of the classic uh, answers here is in these terms. God, in order to display his full glory, has to damn some people. God's full glory, the display of his full glory, is incompatible with saving all persons. So you see this classic line given some sort of expression in the Westminster Confession, which reads as follows. The rest of mankind, those that are not elect, the rest of mankind, was, God was pleased according to the unsearchable counsel of his own will, whereby he extendeth or withholdeth mercy as he pleaseth. Why? For the glory of his sovereign power. Once again, it's all about displaying God's sovereign power. That's what is so impressive. That's what is so important. 
over his creatures to pass by and to ordain them to dishonor and wrath from their sin. Why? Again, to the praise of his glorious justice. So, God must display his sovereign power, the glory of his sovereign power, and he must display his glorious justice by damning some people. And if God failed to do that, he would not be fully glorified. Now, one of the best known proponents of this in contemporary Christianity is your generation's favorite Calvinist. Uh, that would be John Piper. And John Piper raises the question, why are not all persons saved? And he says, the Arminians and the Calvinists give a very different answer. The Arminian answer is the human self-determination, and by the way, I would not agree with the way he describes that part, but at any rate, that's his term. And the possible resulting love relationship with God, that I do think is on track. That's what God is concerned about, genuine relationships of love. It's not that freedom is so important. It's certainly not about self-determination. Possible re resulting love relationship are more valuable than saving all people by sovereign efficacious grace. The answer the Reformed give is that the greater value is the manifestation of the full range of God's glory in wrath and mercy and the humbling of man so he enjoys giving all the credit to God for his salvation. So what's the thing that God values more than saving all persons? The answer is the manifestation of the full range of God's glory in wrath and mercy. So God has to demonstrate his wrath as well as his mercy, or otherwise he fails to be completely glorified. And that would not be right. All right, so that's the Calvinist claim. Now, here, uh, again, let's go back to this, uh, go back to this argument. And look at it. I said, basically, the, the options that seems Calvinists have to take are denying number one or denying number three. Well, here we see they've got another one they can deny. They can deny number five. They can say God cannot properly do this. And again, why could he not properly give everybody irresistible grace? Because there's something of greater value that would be sacrificed. And what is the greater value that would be sacrificed? God's glory being fully displayed. That would be wrong. For God to sacrifice that by saving everybody would be inappropriate. It would be wrong. So that's the greater good that God chooses. Now here again is what I find fascinating about this. Piper nevertheless says God loves the reprobate that are going to be damned forever. Listen to what he says about the reprobate. God has a real and deep compassion for the perishing sinners. God's expressions of pity and his entreaties have heart in them. What is his entreaties? His invitations. Now again, he invites people to do something they can't possibly do. Because he doesn't give them the irresistible grace to respond. But there's still supposed to be heart in the invitation. Make sense of that if you can. Alright? So, God's expression of pity, his entreaties have heart in them. There's genuine inclination in God's heart to spare those who have committed treason against his kingdom. All right? In his great and mysterious heart, there are kinds of longings and desires that are real. They tell us something true about his character, yet not all of these longings govern his actions. So there's sort of like conflicting desires in God's heart. In some sense, he does feel compassion. He does desire the salvation of people. But he's got bigger goals glorifying his wrath and his justice, and that has to take precedence over his desire to save these people. I want you to underline this word about his character. And what we're going to see is that's the big issue. What is the character of God? All right, so in some sense he loves these people, but again, if he has this kind of love, if, if he has some kind of genuine compassion, again, why not respond to it? And again, for Piper it is, God would fail to be God if he didn't damn some people in our world. So again, listen to what Piper writes. More precisely, it is the glory of God and his essential nature. 
This is what he is in his very essence. It is his essential nature, namely to dispense mercy, but also wrath on whomever he pleases. That's the very nature of God. His very essence is to sovereignly give grace to some, but not others. That's the essence of what it means to be God. Right? Okay? So, apart from any constraint or originating outside his will, this is the essence of what it means to be God. That's what God is. And if he fails to give some people wrath, having created the world, he fails to be true to what it means to be God. Now, this seems to be the line of thought in Piper's thinking. So here's another argument of constructive. So premise number one would be this. God is true to himself. I totally agree with that. If God is true to himself, his full glory must be displayed. I agree with that. I agree with both Christian promises. God obviously is true to himself. His very nature is such that he has to be true to himself. He cannot lie. He cannot, you know, be, 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 be false to the ultimate reality, which is himself. <coughs> Number three, if God's full glory must be displayed, again, in a world that God chooses to create, he doesn't have to create at all, Piper emphasizes. But if he does create a world, He's got to display his full glory, and it requires this. So if God's full glory must be displayed, his wrath must be fully displayed. I don't agree with that one. What if we're going to sin at all? Why not just determine everybody not to sin? Why would you need wrath? So wrath is only appropriate if there's already evil. You only need wrath in, the for, in, in case evil's already in the world. But what if there's no evil at all? You wouldn't need it. So the essence of God is holy love. That can be expressed fully even if there were no wrath at all because there would be no sin, right? Now, if God's wrath must be fully displayed, there must be evil persons who are eternally damned. Conclusion, if God is true to himself, there must be persons who are eternally damned. So it appears that God needs evil and needs hell to be fully himself to be God. Now again, I reiterate, Piper clearly says God did not have to create at all. He doesn't have to create. He's not dependent on creation. But if he chooses to create a world like this, the full display of his glory requires pouring out his wrath on some of the persons with him. So God needs evil and hell in this world to fully be God. That's Piper's claim. Now, how much sense does this make? Well, I think it's uh, I think it's dubious on a number of grounds. First of all, it's worth noting that it's dubious in terms of Bible and theology, biblical exegesis. N.T. Wright, the great New Testament scholar, who's a critic of Wright, points out there's a huge mass of scholarly literature on the meaning of God's righteousness. And by the way, and this is Piper's claim, the righteousness of God is revealed. And Piper says the righteousness of God means God must glorify himself. That's what the righteousness of God means. And he Wright responds. There's a huge mass of scholarly literature on the meaning of God's righteousness, and Piper <coughs> simply ignores it. I am not aware of any other scholar, old perspective, new perspective, Catholic, before evangelical, or anyone who thinks that Sakata Elohim in Hebrew or Dekai Sene Theo in Greek actually means. God's concern for God's own glory. So, it's an idiosyncratic view, for one thing. Right? Now, N.T. Wright goes on to say, here's what I think the Bible actually tells us about God's character and his concern for his glory. So once again, listen to Wright. He, that is Piper, he sees it as God's concern for his own glory, which implies that God's primary concern returns, as it were, to himself. There's always a sense in which that is true. But the great story of Scripture from creation and covenant right on through the new, to the New Jerusalem is constantly about God's overflowing, generous, creative love, God's concern, if you like, for the flourishing and well-being of everything else. This is a God whose nature is to desire the flourishing of everything else because He flourishes essentially by Himself. He cannot but flourish. 
and loves to share that flourishing with others. That's what it's all about, according to Genji Wright. Now notice, he continued, of course, this too will redound to God's glory. Because God is the creator, is glorified when creation is flourishing and able to praise Him gladly and freely. That is the sort of God He is. And God's righteousness is a way of saying yes, and God will be true to that character. Again, I, 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 I emphasize this point. The fundamental divide between Calvinists and Arminians is not the sovereignty of God. It's not election, it's not predestination. I believe in God's sovereignty, I believe in election, I believe in predestination. All of that, just not the Calvinist version of it. It's not the authority of the Bible. The fundamental divide is how you understand the character of God. And Piper's view is that God's character is such that he cannot be true to himself. He, to be God means he has to damn people. To be fully displayed, his glory to be fully displayed. In T. Wright. It says that no, not at all. It's not God's concern. God's very nature is, is, is to love, and God glorifies himself. His glory shines forth most brilliantly and beautiful when he causes and leads to the flourishing of those outside of himself as well. Just totally different pictures of the character of God. And the question is. As you read the Bible, and again, what this is important to recognize is this. The debate between Calvinists and Arminians is not a debate over five or six proof texts on either side. It's a debate about how do you read the entire story of Scripture. How do you read the entire narrative from creation to revelation? Is this the picture of God you see? Or do you see a God in order to really look good has to damn people? Wouldn't be fully God if he did it unconditionally to some Passover others? That's a question. All right? So, here uh, is something I find actually ironic. Piper sometimes seems to agree with this. And here's a passage from Piper, one of my favorite passages in Piper's writing, actually. And listen to how much this actually sounds kind of like right, what Wright just said. But is it loving? And again, we're talking about Calvinism and God's love. Is it loving for God to exalt His own glory? Yes, it is. And there are several ways to see this truth clearly. One way is to ponder this sentence. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. If you ever Piper, you know that sentence. Piper says that's the favorite sentence and I want the other God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. Now, if this is true, then it becomes plain why God is loving when He seeks to exalt His glory in my life. In fact, it means that the more passionate God is for His own glory, the more passionate He is for my satisfaction in that glory. And as I read that, I find myself saying, If God is most glorified in us when we're most satisfied in Him, why not give everybody satisfaction and glorify Himself by leading and causing everybody to flourish, everybody to love, everybody to enjoy His grace and His truth and His beauty and His goodness? Why does He have to damn some people before we're glorified if this is true, right? So the serious problems, I think, with Piper's view. And, and uh, I, I've argued this in some of my, my articles, uh, journal articles against the Calvinists, and I really think one of the fundamental issues does come down to this, I said, it comes down to how you understand the character of God. And what this comes down to often is fundamentally different moral intuitions about what goodness looks like and what justice looks like. And here's what I think when I read Piper. He says this glorifies and manifests his glorious justice. That doesn't look anything like justice. But as far as I can see, for God unconditionally to choose to save some people and for all eternity for some to be reprobated, chosen for reprobation, passed over. That doesn't look anything like justice. Now, if you find that just, you might find this makes a certain sort of sense. If you look at it and say, that's nothing like justice. That's not what the Bible would depict justice as being either. 
and you're going to find Piper's referring to this one. And you also might ask this question. If Jesus died for everybody, why does somebody else have to be punished? I mean, Calvinists like to interpret the atonement to mean that it's the pouring out of God's wrath. His wrath is satisfied with the cross. Then why does anybody else have to suffer if that's the case? Why? And why does that have to be eternal punishment? Why couldn't God just spectacularly punish people for a hundred years or a thousand years and then determine them all and give them all irresistible grace? Why does it have to be eternal? These are all questions that beg to be answered. But as Piper sees it, eternal hell is necessary for God really to be seen for who he really is. That's an amazing, amazing thought, I think. Now, you guys have been patient. I've got one more point for you. And this one's really interesting. All right? So this is this is not, a, not in this book. I, I just read this book, too, after I, after I wrote this book. I wish I could put this in this book. But this is some fascinating stuff again. All right, here's another way to make the same move. All right, so again, the point is, Thomas was saying, God may have goals that are simply incompatible with saving the other one. He just looked, one of them is he needs to glorify himself fully. That requires the fullest way of his wrath. That requires hell. That requires damnation. Now, Calvinists have other moves they make besides this. I'm not saying these are the only ones they've got. But here are two interesting ones that have been proposed. And I'm like, you know, can't, this lecture can't go on for hours. We've got to stop at some point, right? So, let's look at the second one that I find fascinating. And it's this suggestion. God chooses to reprobate many people precisely to enhance the happiness of the saved, according to some Calvinists. All right? So in this book right here, there's an article defending hell. And this is the line this author takes in this book. All right? So as he points out, the kind of line Piper takes would only justify, say, damning a few hundred people. I mean, if God wants to glorify his justice, all he needs is a few hundred miserable sinners in hell forever. But look, what if hell's got a lot more than a few hundred? Well, what if there's a lot more people in hell than heaven? What if that's the case? Well, here's a comment that's got an answer for you. He says, I got an explanation of why God might have reasons to damn a lot of people, not just a few hundred of them. Why? Because it will actually make people in heaven happier. Alright? Listen to this. In short, if Calvinism was true, it seems perfectly easy for God to create a world in which universalism, that is everybody saved, is true. A world in which everybody accepts God's offer of salvation and goes to heaven. Why would God do this? Now, by the way, it's interesting to note that a number of Calvinists are starting to move toward universalism. That's kind of a trend, you know. And if you're Calvinist, you should be a universalist. And I, and I say it all in all seriousness. But he says, no reason why God couldn't do this. Have universal salvation. So why wouldn't God do this? I suggest it is for the sake of the occupants of heaven that God creates people to occupy hell. All right? The occupation of hell, here's why, it enables both an understanding of God's nature. So if people go to hell, you understand God's nature more deeply than you would otherwise. And understand that it enables an understanding of God's nature and good attitudes toward God on the part of the elect that wouldn't otherwise be possible. All right? Now, again... This author offers numerous suggestions about what these goods might be. I'm only going to give you a couple of them just to give you a flavor of what Calvinists suggest along these lines. Now, before I get to that, I need to make a distinction here. He distinguishes between reprobation and damnation, the difference between these two decrees. And here's how I can explain it. Let it be clear. I am not going to deal with the question of the permissibility of justice of the, of, of the decree of damnation. I am instead defending here the righteousness of God's decree of reprobation. And what is reprobation? That is, His intentionally causing many people to merit a decree of damnation, which is a different affair altogether. So what is the decree of reprobation? He intentionally causes 
out of all the possible people, some persons to deserve damnation. Causes them to sin. Causes them to reject Christ. Causes them to be worthy of damnation. So he says, I'm not defending the decree of damnation. It's reprobation. It's God's choice to cause some people to be worthy of damnation. Right? Now, again, he offers this, and I, and I don't want to be fair. He is not saying he definitely thinks this is true. He's offering what he calls a theology. And what he says is this. All I'm offering are what you could call plausibly actual reasons for why God names a lot of people. So theodicy is, if you have studied philosophy, you know what a theodicy is. It's an explanation of God's reasons for allowing evil. Now I say, I'm not sure these are God's actual reasons, but these are plausible reasons. So it's possible, for all I know, you can't prove otherwise, that this could be the reason why God bans a lot of people. Alright, so this is his attempt to offer that explanation. So, here are two goods, things that are good, that he thinks outweighs the evil of damnation, the good that results from this. And here they are. So here's the first one. The first one is gratitude through appreciation of the likelihood of the alternative. But consider this quote from Edwards, that is Jonathan Edwards. When the elect see others who were of the same nature, born under the same circumstances, and plunged in such misery, and they are so distinguished, Oh, it will make them sensible how happy they are. Okay? So get this. When you see a bunch of your friends, maybe your childhood friends, your high school buddies, maybe even some of your college classmates, and you say, I was just like them. Born in the same circumstances, I was no different than them. And I'm in heaven and they're in hell. Wow! I got chosen. And I could have easily been in hell. Okay? You like this? Is this getting you excited about going to heaven? Is this a pleasure you anticipate? Okay, so if plucked from a sea of unbelievers, you would therefore have much more cause to be grateful. Now we see that God has reason to make it the case. Notice this, that the damned numerically <coughs> far outstrip the elect. That's the reason. The more reprobated earthly companions the elect receive, the more appropriate or truer it will be for them to say, I could have been damned. And their gratitude at being in heaven will increase. So the more friends you have who end up in hell, and the more you realize I was just like them, and I could have gone to hell and signed the guy. I got chosen. <laughs> How grateful I am. And his view is this will future happiness. Because it will deepen your gratitude to realize the chances are, are so much against this. So Again, it's not enough to have Dan. They have to far outstrip the number of the elect. Now this right away raises fascinating questions. What do you have to have? 101? Would that be beyond? But wouldn't you, wouldn't you be even more grateful if it's 1,000 to 1? For every saved person, there was 1,000 people damned. What about a million to 1? Man, you'd be really grateful if it was a million to 1, wouldn't you? Where does it stop? You see. But this is a suggestion. The more people are damned, the more grateful you are that you're not one of them because you realize, that could have been me. The odds are incredible. Wow. Now, there's a second argument along the same lines. Gratitude through appreciation of the frequency of the alternative. Very similar. Consider the following scenario. You attend a house party to which you receive an invitation. The wine flows, the heart is made glad. Now suppose you discover there are a great many people outside, all clamoring for entry, but who can't enter because they have not been invited. Your happiness of being invited is likely to increase, and this reaction is surely appropriate. The rarer a desirable commodity, the higher it is valued. By reprobating a greater number to hell, the elect 
are permitted a greater gratitude not otherwise available to them. The gratitude of being part of the few that are saved. <clears throat> and I'll just let that sink in. Again, the more people are damned, the happier heaven will be according to this picture. Now, again, he says, I'm not necessarily saying this is true, I'm saying this is possibly true. These are plausible reasons. Well, this to me is a great example, once more of the point I just made a moment ago, that we have some fundamental ground layer intuitions that are just radically different. Does this strike you as an even remotely what a loving God would do? This struck you as even remotely the sort of happiness a God of perfect love would desire for his creatures. And he begins this line of what he calls familial partiality. And he says, look, fathers are partial to their children. They don't give all the neighborhood kids allowance. They don't buy all the neighborhood kids a bicycle. They take care of their own kids. They won't do them. You know, that's the ones they're concerned about. He says, this is what it is with God. The ones he cares about is the left. The rest of the people... He didn't care about them in the same way. They're not his children. So his concern is to make the elect happy, and if this makes the elect happier, so be it. Alright? That's the that's the claim here. Right? So notice, again, he says this is actually motivated by love. Alright? So again, this is Calvinist view of love. Again, not all Calvinists, this Calvinist. He gets his inspiration from John Edward and John Calvin. And again, he writes, But if it's God's love for certain of his creatures that is the overarching motive here. Notice this line again. The reprobate is useful instrumentally. Reprobate are useful instrumentally. You are a useful instrument for the happiness of the elect. God chooses you for reprobation as an instrument to enhance the happiness of those who are elect. That's the claim here. All right? The reprobate is useful and surrounding for the goods which God, from a loving motive, desires to bestow on the elect. Does God love them at all? Well, I'm happy to ascribe to God a non paternal love. For the reprobate, and therefore for a desire for the reprobate's good, just so long as it is remembered that familiar partialism is going to give God a much greater desire for the elect's good. Alright? So get this picture. God loves his sons, he loves his elect. The name of the reprobate, they're instrumentally useful to make the elect happier. Is he lovable? In some sense, he desires their well being. But look, for the elect to be truly happy in heaven, they have to be damned. So that's, that's what needs to be done. Again, does this at all resonate with the God of the Bible, who's depicted as like a shepherd who has 99 sheep that is lost, and says, that one out on the hillside, let him go. This resonate with the God who's depicted as having the prodigal son and say, my son at home is what I love, to hell with him. No, he welcomes him back. The lost coin seeks the lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost son. This, I think, is the picture of God, the, 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 the God of the Bible. This reads nothing to me like what the God of love is depicted in the Bible. And that those who would be transformed and love God would not love this kind of happiness. This is not what would make them happy. If you think you would be happy in heaven for these reasons, you will find Calvinism perhaps more plausible. But if you read this and say, that doesn't strike me as at all this sort of thing. It would not make me happy in heaven to see my high school friends who are just like me, bang him unconditionally, or God was chosen unconditionally, and they were not. Now, I'm almost done. I'm coming to my conclusion. Alright? 
So hell lasts forever, lectures on hell do not. Thank you. <laughs> I reiterate, in closing, Calvinists don't usually talk like this. Popular Calvinism, as it is preached today and represented by many people, in its frankly, intellectually unsophisticated versions, is often far removed from what its intellectual, serious, sophisticated proponents defend. And many of the people who think they're Calvinists and who defend Calvinism frankly do not understand it. Why? Because popular Calvinism often sounds like they too believe God loves everybody. Not in this sense, not even in the Piperian sense, but more in the sense of really desiring everybody's happiness and flourishing. Calvinists often give the impression they believe that and they desire that too. That's what keeps it afloat. I've said this before. The Calvinism were forthright, insisted, and laid its stuff on the line, laid its cards on the table. Its plausibility, I believe, it went with Wayne in a short time. I conclude with an illustration from Charles Spurgeon. There's a recent book called The Four Views on Hell, to which I contributed an essay. And the person in the book who defended the traditional view of hell in this book was a Calvinist. In hell and Calvinist terms. He concluded his essay with this quotation from Spurgeon. Now listen to this. Oh, my brothers and sisters in Christ, if sinners will be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. And if they will perish, let them perish with their arms about their knees, imploring them to stay and not madly to destroy themselves. If hell must be filled, at least let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions and let none go there unwarned and unprayed for. Charles Spurgeon was one of the greatest preachers in the history of the world. Great man of God. He was a Calvinist. <clears throat> but you read this, and it sounds like he wants everybody to be saved. And you might get the impression he thinks God wants everybody to be saved. You know? But if you keep putting Calvinism as a line, if they leap over and are determined in hell, it's because they're not chosen. They can't help it. They're not given irresistible grace. That's why they're leaping. They're leaping in exactly the way they're determined to leap. But he sounds like we should love these people. And actually, these could be the people that would make you happier by their damnation. But here I heard the confession just to love them. To love them. So in conclusion, I would simply say this. If you read the scripture, and as you read the scripture, you are deeply convinced God truly, deeply, sincerely loves all persons desires all persons to be in the right relationship with himself and desires all persons the joy and happiness of heaven. If you believe that, you don't want to be a Calvinist.